wait a second, this is in Japan. But I thought I was going to talk about tritium in seawater. Well, I'm actually in Astoria, Oregon, where they filmed the 1985 movie The Goonies and a bunch of others. It's actually really cool. I got to check out the Astoria Film Museum, which has a bunch of Goonies stuff in it. <laughs> this is pretty cool. I'm a big Goonies fan. So now why would I want to talk about radioactive water being discharged in the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima in Astoria, Oregon? Maybe because something similar to that actually happened here. Not really here in Astoria per se, but along the Columbia River where Astoria sits for over three decades. The Hanford site with its graphite moderated single pass reactors that were made to create plutonium discharged radioactive water into the Columbia River. And they did this for about three decades, from about 1943, 1944, up until right, right around 1971 when they shut down. They had single pass graphite reactors that would take water from the Columbia River and pipe it through the reactor. Once that water passed through the reactor, it became radioactive. It picked up a bunch of other contaminants just from stuff breaking down inside the reactor, like little pieces of rust that became radioactive as well as soon as they passed through the reactor. And so this was all held in a holding pond for a couple of hours for the really nasty stuff, the really radioactive stuff that has very short half-lives to decay away rather quickly. And then that water was discharged back into the Columbia River. They weren't filtering it out like they were or they are at Fukushima. So they were just dumping this straight into the river. And so this went on for decades. And I've looked in a bunch of different places and I've never seen like a cluster of cancers along the Columbia River that would have uh, maybe been exacerbated by the dumping of that cooling water into the Columbia. So when everyone starts freaking out about Fukushima taking that cooling water that they've been using to cool down those damaged reactors, I don't see the reason why everyone's freaking out because if you want to see an example of what happens just look at the Columbia River and all the communities along there. So I'm back here in Montana and I wanted to talk about Becquerel's. Now that is the unit of activity that they're measuring the contamination that's being released from Fukushima. And I know you're probably thinking, what the hell is a Becquerel? And I think that is a huge problem of what they're doing when they're trying to explain a lot of this stuff because they say like, oh, 1500 Becquerels or, or whatever, or Terra Becquerels or Giga Becquerels or something along those lines. And it's like, people hear that and they're just like, like what does that even mean? Like, how do I even like uh, relate that to something in the real world? And so that's what I'm gonna try and do at this part of the video is actually try and assign some numbers to things that you can actually be like, okay, well that, that's, that's how many Becquerels are in a uh, tritium exit sign or in some gun sites that have tritium inside of them as well. And by using that, you can kind of actually understand, well, how much contamination is being released from Fukushima uh, based on the numbers that TEPCO is providing about this whole situation. So that's what my numbers are based off of too. I kind of have to trust what they're saying. Um, I have no reason not to other than I think they do a terrible job of explaining stuff to the public, uh, which is why there's so much distrust. <laughs> but anyway, let's get into it. So with Becquerel's and Curie's, what they're talking about is when that thing was first manufactured, because over the course of time, when tritium or any other radioactive isotope decays, it becomes less active because there's less of it. And so when they say 25 Curie's of tritium or 925 gigabecquerels of tritium or something along those lines, they're actually uh, looking at it as it was made in that time and how much is in there. Because it's hard to say, well, there's 2.5 milligrams of tritium inside of one of these exit signs. That's hard to just 
say that number that that's the way it is because that's not what happens over the course of time. It actually decays. And so when it releases that, that radiation, it actually is no longer tritium anymore. It's, it's something else. It's actually, I think it goes back down to helium or to hydrogen when it decays away. And so when that happens, you don't have the 2.5 milligrams of tritium in there anymore. You actually have a little, little bit less. And so after 12 years, you're going to have half as much of that tritium inside of that exit sign. And so the Becquerel's and Curie's and, and all those activity measurements are just to kind of show you the activity. And it's like a really hard conversion thing because there's like, it's, it's hard to say that there's, there's so much of this one thing in there based off of something that's constantly disappearing over time. That's the problem with radioactive isotopes is that nothing's really constant. You have ones that last for like a really long time, like uranium-238 or thorium-232. Those have very long half-lives measured in billions of years. And so those can be, um, it's a little bit more of a standardized thing, but even those are decaying away and turning into other isotopes. So these tritium exit signs can be found at a lot of different locations. I actually uh, found a couple at the Laguna Hotel down in Laguna Beach. And then also a couple that were up on the roof of the Apple campus when I was there for a job. That I got fired off of. <laughs> yeah, see? Um, but anyway, so these exit signs can be found everywhere and you can just order them online. They're kind of a big deal though. There's like a licensing thing that they are like, oh, well now this is licensed to you and don't tamper with them and all this other stuff. And it's like, yeah, I, I get that. You know, you don't want people busting open these things because it's not completely harmless. I would imagine if you broke open those tubes and were just huffing the gas right out of there, it might not be a great experience. It, it might cause you to become sick in some capacity. I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you, because that level of exposure from a beta emitter like tritium isn't that big of a deal. There are far greater sources of radiation that are out there that if you were exposed to, which would be far more harmful. Uh, usually tritium doesn't stay in the body for that long. And so uh, if you are exposed to it, it actually does leave the body. It doesn't bioaccumulate in the body like some other radioactive isotopes do. So it's very different what happened at the Columbia River because they were just uh, feeding that water straight through that reactor and it was becoming contaminated and activated. Uh, a couple of different things that happen there. One is it picks up contaminants as it passes through the reactor. The other one is uh, water, the elements in the water actually become activated from the neutrons inside of the reactor. And so this is usually how tritium is formed uh, in water. There's a couple other ways of how tritium is formed. But in this case, it was from the single pass reactor sending that water right through the reactor and then into a holding pond for a couple of hours and then right back into the Columbia River. And so this was much worse than what's going on at Fukushima, but uh, there's really been no complaints from anyone about the contamination there in the river or in the fish that is uh, being caught there and sold all around Washington and Oregon. The salmon that's caught there, it's, it's pretty funny because a lot of people are trying to make it seem like Fukushima is going to poison the Pacific Ocean by releasing this contaminated water, and that is simply not the case. So these are some of the tritium items that I have. This exit sign that has tritium tubes inside of it, this tritium compass, the tritium gun sights, and a couple of vials of tritium that I got off of Amazon that apparently they don't sell anymore. But these are all great examples of uses for tritium because they're all supposed to be used in dark situations. And tritium actually replaced radium in the whole luminous paint, luminous aid type of thing for watches, for compasses, for gun sights, for exit signs, for all kinds of stuff, even though I'm not totally sure. I don't think radium was ever used in exit sign. That would have been a very expensive exit sign. So when you turn off the lights, you can see how tritium glows very well in the dark. And it does this for a while. Tritium's half-life is about 12 years. And so after 12 years, the tritium gas that's inside of these items 
will have lost about half of its brightness because half of that tritium has decayed away. Beta particles that are coming off of the tritium gas interacting with that phosphor coating, which then glows from that interaction. So it's actually not the tritium itself that's glowing. So if you were to just uh, crack open a thing of tritium into like a, another container that didn't have that coating, you wouldn't see any glow. Usually when these items uh, get beyond that 12 year mark, that's uh, that's usually what the lifetime is for these items, is that they state that they're around 10 to 12 years, and after that time they should be should be replaced, even though you can continue to use them still, they're just not gonna be as bright as they were. This tritium exoside is too terribly radioactive. It only is detected a little bit by the rad IB20, Usually normal background radiation is around 35 counts per minute, and this one went up to a little over 300 counts per minute, and that's very low for a radioactive source such as this. Now I put my Radicode 102 right up against it to actually see if I can get a gamma spectrum off of the tritium. Now, tritium doesn't give off any gamma rays, but what it does is it actually has a bremsstrung radiation, and that's a breaking radiation. So when an electron like hits a surface, it slows down suddenly and that transfer of energy actually releases an x-ray or another form of uh, energy another photon and so that's usually a much lower energy level and so yeah, i'm just actually really surprised that the radicode 102 was able to detect this much lower energy level photon or gamma ray it's actually right at the very edge of what it can detect or what it shows up on the graph. I've never seen the four kilo electron volt actually come up as a peak on the gamma spectroscopy on the Radicode 102. So that's actually a pretty cool little feature. So as you can see, there actually is a peak right at the very edge of the graph that is shot up here. And what that is, is the actual photon that's being detected right around the four kilo electron volt range and that's pretty rare. I usually never see that with stuff. It's only uh, like an X-ray that's created from that Bremsstrung radiation. So if you're looking to pick up a Radicode 102, there'll be a link in the description, and there's a link right here in case you just want to type it in. These run around uh, 275 US. Uh, it's a great little piece of kit to have with, with you when you're out exploring or uh, just want to learn a little bit more about radiation. Works great when it's uh, paired with a smartphone works on Android and iOS a little bit. They're still beta testing the app, but anyway, back to the video. So these tritium exit signs do disassemble a little bit. Uh, not much though, because they're designed not to be taken apart, but this is how much you can take it apart without, you know, employing some type of cutting or something along those lines, which I'm not advocating. Don't cut into these things if you get one. Uh, it is kind of a big deal. They, they have like a serial number with them that's license to your address that you go and you put that with and so it's it's one of those things that's uh filed forever away in some uh nrc file somewhere that there's a tritium exit sign on site at your residence and so uh i don't know how what's the long-term implications of that we'll have to see when uh you know i move or something along those lines and then once you put it back together and flip it over onto the other side on the frame, it actually gives you an expiration date. So at that point, you can choose to go and send the sign back to the manufacturer and they will dispose of it, or you can just uh, hang on to it. But I don't think it's legal to keep the sign past the expiration date because it will lose too much of its luminosity to actually be useful as an exit sign. On average, there's around two tritium exit signs worth inside of those containers of water. On average, it's, it varies based on the size, but on average is around two exit signs. So if you're just gonna go into a, a container of water, like those really big ones on site there at Fukushima, and then just broke open two of those tritium exit signs that just took them apart and broke open the tubes inside of them, you would deposit the same amount of tritium into that water as there is from them running that water through and around those damaged reactors. So I'm just going to use the tritium exit signs to kind of describe the like how much tritium is there on site because using those gun sites it's like around like 300 and 
25 of those gun sites in each one of those containers of water on average they're on site and i think when you start getting to the lower activity stuff the numbers just get higher so i'm just going to try and keep it simple with just saying like two exit signs or or 217 exit signs so all the water that's being stored at fukushima all the tritium that's inside there comes out to about 2,175 of those exit signs worth of tritium to give you an idea of all of the tritium on site there. And so on average, if they were going to go and the water was going to be released over the course of 10 years, that's as short as I've heard. I've heard as long as 30. That's a really long time to release all that water. If they go to release that contaminated water over the course of the next 10 years, it's about 217 of those tritium exit signs worth of tritium being released into the Pacific Ocean each year. That's what it is on average. So that comes out to less than one tritium exit sign per day. So if you were to take one of those tritium exit signs, go into the Pacific Ocean, break it open, take it into the water, break open those tubes underwater, every day for the next year, you would actually release more than what Fukushima is going to be releasing into the Pacific Ocean. And so hopefully that gives you an idea of like how much tritium is actually being released. And in the vast scheme of things, that is nothing, nothing compared to like, say the contamination of the Columbia River. That was, that had way more contamination over the three decades that those single pass graphite reactors were operating for. So after 1971 at the Hanford site, they actually closed down all of those single pass reactors and went to a closed loop cooling system instead of just passing that water straight through the reactor then back into the Columbia River. I think they were trying to kind of contain contamination there and all those reactor designs were very old and kind of antiquated and they needed something a little bit uh, better at performing the job of making plutonium for the nuclear weapons program. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.